Okay, hi there. Welcome to a special video uh, recorded in March of 2021, where we're going to spend a few minutes thinking about how we can highlight some areas of your economics course where you might be able to, to use the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine as an interesting and useful applied example. It took just over 300 days for a COVID-19 vaccine to be tested and approved by the authorities. It's a remarkable achievement in many ways <clears throat> by some of the world's leading pharmaceutical companies. The previous record for a new vaccine was between four and five years. So getting a vaccine to market in this speed is, is clearly a remarkable achievement. And indeed, effective vaccines have been developed by the likes of Pfizer-BioNTech, the Oxford-AstraZeneca vaccine produced in the UK, Moderna, Sinovac, Janssen and others. Uh, the huge challenge now, of course, is to scale manufacturing of the vaccine and then to distribute and vaccinate the world, including hundreds of millions of people in the world's lower and middle income countries. We think that vaccinations have many micro and macro applications to your economics assessments. Quick overview, first of all, about the vaccine rollout up to and including the 15th of March. So which countries are leading the, the race, if you like, to vaccinate their own populations? Well, Israel gained a pretty significant head start on other countries, partly because it negotiated early on in the, in the, in the issue uh, for supplies of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. Uh, they also provided medical data uh, on, on the impact of the campaign to those companies. And the Israeli rollout has proven particularly successful. They've got a very good healthcare system, a young population, a relatively small population, and a high level of vaccine take-up. So they're ahead of the game. UAE is, is pretty strong. UK, Chile and the United States, of course, is now starting to make big strides under the Biden administration. Uh, the, 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 here's a state of play of the sheer volume of vaccination doses ordered by the, the British government. I think it's a good example of monopsony and buying power in the market. So the UK government, obviously with Oxford, Oxford AstraZeneca leading the way, has ordered hundreds of millions of doses as of uh, the end of November 2020, that figure no doubt will have gone up since then. So what about some of the microeconomic topics and issues that you could link to vaccinations? Now, I'm not pretending this is going to be an exhaustive list, but hopefully this will be a useful way of little, little checklist, if you like, of, of ways in which uh, you can apply the vaccination issue to lots of things you might have been studying in your economics courses. So there's a lot here. I'll hold on to this slide for a little while as we go through it. Here are some of the microeconomic aspects. First is essentially the, the idea of vaccine. What type of good is a vaccine? Uh, there's a strong public good aspect, clearly, that uh, the benefits that vaccines um, uh, create in terms of uh, reducing hospitalizations, uh, bringing down the risk of serious illness and, and, uh, and uh, premature death, and in terms of uh, reducing the pass on of infection the transmissibility of infection. So there's a very strong public good aspect of vaccines. But of course, vaccines are not a pure public good because they are rival. One, having Giving one person a vaccine means there's less for somebody else. And in many ways, they're excludable. Witness the battle to secure and pay for vaccine supplies across the world. But vaccines have a very strong public good aspect in terms of their impact on, on, on the wider public health. Loads of economics to do with conditions of supply. For example, the elasticity of supply. How quickly can we increase and ramp up production? What are the supply constraints in the short term? Uh, distinctions between fixed and variable costs. The fixed costs, for example, would include research and development. And the variable costs include the glass and the, uh, used to making the vials and, and all the other ingredients used in manufacturing. Key distinction to make between average cost, cost per vaccine, and the marginal cost, the marginal cost of the next vial produced. Clearly, if most of the costs are fixed, then the greater the volume of production, that should bring down the unit cost of, of production. Uh, the de derived demand is an important idea that uh, the components used in making vaccines and in rolling out the vaccines from syringes, to uh, sturdy glass vials, really strong derived demand for related products. And I think point four is important. Being able to vaccinate the world at speed and at scale involves scale. The economies of scale in vaccine manufacturing is a crucial issue. 
Those of you who've studied market structures will be interested in the, in the vaccine industry. Essentially, pharmaceuticals is an oligopoly, an industry dominated by big players, the likes of Merck and Sanofi uh, and GSK and AstraZeneca. Interestingly, though, uh, although the, the entry barriers to the pharmaceutical market, markets are huge, uh, Moderna, which has created one of the, one of the big vaccines globally, uh, they had previously never bought a, a product to market. So it is possible to contest the global industry for vaccines. In that sense, it becomes a contestable oligopoly. And then we can bring in all kinds of concepts to do with economic efficiency. How, how productively efficient are national healthcare systems in rolling out vaccinations? Some countries obviously have a, have a more efficient system and scale system than others. The private costs and benefits have been vaccinated. Think, thinking about the rationality of, of whether to take up a vaccine offer. There's obviously a cost and a benefit in, included. Some risk involved in the news recently. Uh, linked to that is the idea of information failures, information gaps. Perhaps uh, the asymmetry of information about the impact of vaccines is one of the causes of vaccine hesitancy. Is it rational not to take up a vaccine? Loads of questions there to do with information about the complexity of, 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 the, of the vaccine itself. And you will have studied externalities as part of market failure. So the positive externalities from consumption of a vaccine, uh, trying, to, trying to calibrate the values of the social benefits and social costs in terms of the, the spending on vaccine rollouts. Huge micro debates about how COVID vaccines should be priced. Uh, should prices be regulated? How much profit should the big pharmaceutical companies be able to make uh, when they are uh, developing and then manufacturing these vaccines. Linked to that, of course, is the concept of business objectives. Are the world's leading pharmaceutical companies such as AstraZeneca, are they profit maximizers or are they satisficers? Or, are, or, or is there a sense that corporate social responsibility is growing in importance? AstraZeneca and their partner at Oxford University have agreed to supply their vaccine at cost in perpetuity, for perpetuity if you like, for the, forever, for the world's poorer countries. Big issues to do with price discrimination in the global vaccine market, charging high prices in countries where income per capita is much bigger and lower prices perhaps in emerging countries. Monopoly power, buying power in the market, comes into play, particularly among the major vaccine purchasers, including governments. And then behavioural economics. Uh, in some countries, vaccine take-up is low. What, what kind of behavioural nudges might we be able to use to, uh, to increase vaccine take-up? How can we overcome uh, fake news, for example, and how can we overcome vaccine hesitancy? And big fans of game theory wouldn't, would, wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't like it if I didn't mention a little bit of game theory. To what extent are governments cooperating with each other in terms of uh, trying to manufacture and distribute equitably uh, the vaccines that are available or are we descending into defective strategies within game theory as countries practice vaccine nationalism wow there are 15 examples of vaccinations and how you can apply them in microeconomics what about the macroeconomic aspects of vaccines well the economic damage caused by the pandemic and subsequent public health lockdowns is, is clearly shown in this chart which tracks real GDP for the UK economy. The UK economy shrank by just under 10% during 2020, a rebound in the summer and autumn, but again, another fall uh, as, as another lockdown was imposed around the turn of the year. And uh, the world economy, of course, was, uh, was hit by this enormous shock created by the pandemic last year. Well, boosted by the, the world vaccine rollout, gradual reopenings and, and government fiscal stimuli. Uh, most economic forecasters, including the IMF and this forecast from the OECD, expects world GDP to pick up in 2021, perhaps as, as fast as 6% this year and continuing into next year. And so therefore world output should pick up. The world economy starts to recover. However, there's a huge amount of uncertainty, isn't there? A lot of uncertainty, virus, my, virus, new, new virus mutations uh, that could spark extra infections, uh, delays in vaccination campaigns, etc. Uh, doubts over the effectiveness of vaccinations. There's lots and lots of uncertainty as we head into 2021.
So here are a few macroeconomic ways that you can link the vaccine issue to your, your studies in economics. First of all, there is the wider global economic damage inflicted by the pandemic and, and, the, and the fear that this economic shock, this huge negative external shock, could lead to some hysteresis effects. Um, you know, for example, a significant rise in unemployment and the loss of skills and obviously the, the loss of, uh, of productivity created by the pandemic. Linked to that is uh, the consequences of long COVID, which we're starting to understand more about. Uh, you know, what are the economic, the macroeconomic consequences of mental health issues, millions of years of lost education, uh, people being out of work and the potential damage to human capital. On the fiscal side, government spending billions of pounds in uh, buying up vaccines and then delivering them. So there's a fiscal cost there equally. Uh, there's a fiscal benefit in the sense that you know, state-funded rollouts of vaccines help to bring economies back, in, back into motion again. And in many ways, that recovery in the economy can help pay for the vaccine uh, investments. So what are the fiscal multipliers of state-funded vaccine programmes? And then if you've studied globalisation, is, is, is this vaccination issue um, proof positive of the benefits of embedded globalisation, the, the joint ventures across countries, the willingness of countries to, to share research and knowledge and ideas and indeed spread manufacturing across many countries? Is, is it a, is it a realisation of some of the benefits of our interconnected, uh, multipolar, globalised world? Or, point five, are we seeing for example, with vaccine nationalism, a retreat into more protectionism as countries look after their own national self-interests. I think comparative advantage is a great macroeconomic concept. Uh, consider, for example, the Serum Institute in, in India. Uh, the Serum Institute is one of the world's biggest manufacturers of, of vaccinations. Absolutely fantastic example. And uh, they, will, they are likely to produce most of the vaccines for some of the world's poorest countries. They can manufacture them at very low cost and at scale. So a comparative advantage, which countries can supply vaccines at the lowest price. Uh, macro macroeconomics, of course, vaccinations needed to halt what is widely regarded as a major threat to extreme poverty. There's some people suggesting, the World Bank, for example, that a decade's worth of progress in cutting extreme poverty is at risk because of the pandemic. Vaccines have a much wider macroeconomic effect in terms of giving us a pathway back towards normality, including, for example, the restoration of, of global travel and tourism and other areas of trade. And fundamentally, and this is, I think, is a big issue, uh, the whole issue of economic development. Developing countries around the world, they do need greater financing and, in many cases, debt relief for the immediate rollout of COVID-19 vaccines, COVID-19 vaccines, and uh, as uh, preparation to cope with uh, for future pandemics. So whilst people in wealthy countries discuss the merits of vaccination passports and being able to travel overseas this summer, hundreds of millions of people in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, just lack basic access to COVID-19 vaccines. Vaccine equity is a major, major macro policy issue for the world economy. This, this example of comparative advantage is really interesting. Where, where does manufacturing uh, take place? Uh, clearly, the United States is the dominant, dominant centre, but look there, India and China come in second and third. India has a high capability and capacity uh, to produce vaccines at more than 3 billion possible doses. The Serum Institute is the biggest vaccine manufacturer in the world, something like 1.5 billion doses annually from the Serum Institute, and uh, uh, they can produce at, at low cost and at, at low prices. Uh, a quick look at the fiscal stimulus. So just to give you a feel and a flavour for the cost of the COVID response in the States, the response directly to COVID-19, including vaccination rollout, is now put at over $123 billion. But of course, that's part of a much bigger stimulus package, a $1.9 trillion stimulus package just, just cleared Congress in the United States. Uh, direct payments to households, uh, $1,400 checks to individuals, a big, big stimulus programme as a complement, if you like, to the vaccination programme. And then fundamentally, and we'll finish with this point, um, the, the whole issue of equity and fairness in the global distribution of vaccines. We know, we know 
that the availability of vaccines is one of the starkest, most clear aspects of the inequalities exposed by the COVID pandemic. Having proper access to healthcare provision systems and capabilities to roll out the vaccine is a major issue as we head into the late spring and summer of 2021. Please do be aware of the role of COVAX, uh, which is basically aiming it's a multilateral coalition of, of um, governments and organisations. It's basically aiming to provide a, a fairly equitable access to vaccines for over 90 lower and middle income countries through donations. The United States has made the biggest donation so far. The UK is third. But you know, equity is a crucial economic and social concept. As of the end of February 2021, a large number of countries had not even yet started their COVID-19 vaccination programme. They hadn't been able to secure enough doses to, to begin inoculating the population, including healthcare workers, presumably at the greatest risk. And many African countries, as you can see from this chart, many countries in sub-Saharan Africa have simply struggled to compete with high-income governments, um, governments of wealthy countries when it comes to buying and securing those scarce supply of vaccines. My instinct is that this will become one of the most important issues of the rest of 2021, if it isn't already that increasing the equity in the flow of vaccines is going to be absolutely fundamental to all of us. Well, there we go. Uh, I've tried in this video to think about how you can use the vaccine issue as examples in your assessment answers. And clearly in your assessments in 2021, you'll be thinking about COVID-19 and the pandemic and making interesting uh, points in, in your answers, and which is fantastic because economics, if it isn't social, if it isn't behavioural, if it isn't applied, isn't really a subject at all. So good luck with that. And thanks for joining me on this video.